are exactly 18 days from the season opener at Purdue and a couple weeks into fall camp. So naturally, we got a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, once again, Tim Aiden, Black Shoe Diaries, joined by my trusty colleague from BSD as usual, Marty Leap. Marty, how are you, sir? I can't complain. You know, and anyone else out there listening who's a fellow teacher, I know you you know the struggle this time of year. You know the uh, rush this time of year getting into your classroom and getting things ready, which was the entire last week for me in this upcoming week. But other than that, I can't complain at all. Hey, football is here. We, we actually have real football stuff to talk about, which is great. And, yeah, I can't wait for September 1st and for kickoff against Purdue. Right. It'll, it'll It's amazing how quickly this summer just seemed to fly by and now – here we are, just two and a half weeks to go uh, for what should be a interesting season opener. And we will get more into that upcoming game as well as do a run through for the entire schedule, uh, make our predictions on for each game on here. Um, and then, of course, we'll take your questions at the very end of the show. Um, before that, though, we're going we're gonna to dive a little bit into fall camp. Uh, it's been a couple weeks now since fall camp first started. And – uh, if you're a fan like Marty and I, you I'm sure you've been digging into Lions 24-7 or on three or whatever Penn State site you might subscribe to to get uh, some practice notes, reports, any idea of how, you know, is Sean Clifford going to be uh, the pre-injury Sean Clifford? <laughs> will, will the O-line actually be serviceable this year? How's that linebacker situation looking and whatnot? So, uh, Marty, uh, I was reading an article on on three. Uh, there's a couple on there. One was very praiseworthy of the D line, especially the newcomers denied Dennis Sutton and transfer Chop Robinson. And then there's another article just more about the different positions, all the positions on the field, and they had some very glowing things to say, uh, um, especially about Sean Clifford being in his second year under Mike Yurcich's offense and how uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, spoil anything from a paid article, but uh, the word in command of the system was something that really stuck out to me. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts about, uh, you know, how you're feeling about Cliff and maybe just the offense as a whole? Yeah, I think one thing I know we've kind of touched on it at times and during the offseason and people can't – you can't overestimate how much this means. This is the first time in Sean Clifford's career as a starting quarterback. He has the same offense coordinator back-to-back seasons. So he's not trying to learn a system. Like you say, he's trying to master it, try to get full command of that system. I think that goes a long way, especially because we saw last year before Cliff got hurt what he could do in this system. Is Sean Clifford a perfect quarterback? No, not even close. He has – plenty of flaws as a quarterback that said when he was healthy Mike Yersich who is a tremendous quarterback coach and offense coordinator was getting the absolute best out of Sean Clifford so I think there's reason to be optimistic that if Clifford's healthy this year we can see him do what he did in those first four and a half games last year before getting hurt against Iowa and you know you touched on the defensive line one thing I will say is everything that has come out of practices that the media has been able to be at thus far Man, I love Manny Diaz. There was a practice last week where linebackers are practicing a drill, recovering fumbles, and I forget who the linebacker was, missed the ball, rolled out of bounds, and Manny Diaz yells at the linebackers. That's the difference between winning 10 games. Not, not verbatim, but something along the lines of, this is the difference between winning 10 games and going to the effing Weed Whacker Bowl. And I feel like <laughs> – I saw I, that clip. That was yeah, I, I feel like Penn State kind of is – been missing some of that edge a little bit in recent years. And that's no knock on Brent Pry because Brent Pry was a tremendous defense coordinator, but it's good to see that in the program. And it's good to see Manny having that attitude because that's, that's something I think any football team can benefit from having. Uh, first of all, thank you for the super sticker Falconer Jones. We appreciate it. Um, yeah. Just, I think just to add on as well to the quarterback. So I'm just from what I read in the, it sounds like Christian Vey, no surprise, he's got the backup spot locked up. But uh, I was happy to read it. From what it sounds like, Drew Aller, a uh, kid who's, you know, no stranger to the fan base, hasn't been a stranger to the fan base really for the past year now. But it sounds like he's making some real strides towards 
becoming that number three quarterback on the roster. And, uh, you know, frankly, uh, if Drew Hour is your number three quarterback and is uh, developing well at this point, I'd say it's a much better situation. It's almost like a 180 from a year ago when Cliff got knocked out at Iowa and they had to rely on a very green Taquan Roberson to, to try to close out the game. Yeah. That's one thing too, at this season, you know, you talk about the importance of quarterback play and obviously, I mean, quarterback is probably the most important position in, in all sports, but so, so it's kind of a cop out to say, Oh, you got to get, you got to get Sean Clifford to stay healthy. That said, the quarterback room is night and day ahead of where it was last year this time. I and mean, we saw against Iowa, there were times Taquan Roberson literally could not snap the ball. And now you have Christian Veyu, who has a decent amount of game experience, played a really good game against Rutgers, got experience against a good Arkansas defense in a bowl game, has been in the program for two years now. And behind him, you have a five-star in Drew Aller and Bo Perbiola, who is maybe the most – Stats wise, maybe the most successful quarterback in the history of high school football in Pennsylvania. Your your quarterback room is in pretty good shape on those year four options. So I think that goes a long way for Penn State also to where the kind of game Clifford plays to reach his max potential. He needs to be running, he needs to be moving. You're gonna take hits, your injury risk goes up. But I think Penn State I mean, we saw it last year when Clifford came back. They did not move him, they did not run him, and it really limited the offense. I think this year, knowing that they have legitimate options behind Clifford. They're not going to do that. And we're going to see him still use his legs to make plays, extend plays, roll out in the pocket. And I think that again, goes back to allowing us to see the offense that we saw for the first five and a half games in 2021. Absolutely. I was, I think you touched on, but I was going to add, I remember reading an art, uh, some, someone on 24 sevens notes of, from a practice about how, they plan on allowing Cliff to to run more. Like they're not gonna, they're kind of taking the shackles off him as far as limiting when he can take off and run because that's how confident they feel in their backup quarterback situation at this point. They feel like they got two game ready guys in Cliff and Veyu, and and then if you got and if reports about Drew Aller uh, making strides are indeed true, then you know like. Worst case scenario, emergency, backup guy, like, you know, you, you could definitely do a lot worse than him. So it's definitely a comforting thing to read. Um, you know, another addition, another thing that's really stuck out to me offensively, just from reading various uh, r- reports on the insider sites and also just some of the videos the Penn State football social media channel has been putting out. Uh, I mean, we have talked about Nick Singleton you know, being a stud, but how about Catron Allen, man? Uh, he, I don't know if you saw the video uh, from, it was put up on the social media it was from a practice and he just, I mean, he just stiff arms uh, Mackay Flowers, his fellow <laughs> friend, and just kind of like one of those, like, you know, get out of my, get the F out of my way kind of shoves. And I mean, poor Mackay, I, I think, I'm sure he's okay, but, but man, also at the same time, holy cow, I, I mean, I, I knew Catron Allen, there was, you know, there was a lot of promise in him, but he seemed a lot more explosive than I guess I would have anticipated. Because he's, I guess I had pictured him as more of a power back, kind of like Kevon Lee is supposed to be like that type, but guy's got a, guy's got some quick footwork too. Yeah, the comparison I've always made for Catron Allen, and I'll be the first to admit this is a bit of a cop out because they're both IMG guys, is Noah Kane. He's a power runner who, when he needs to turn on the speed a little bit and run past the defender, he can. Um, I, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that the two best running backs on this roster are true freshmen. I mean, I definitely think Singleton is the best running back on the roster. I think Singleton, I mean, for goodness sake, I think Nick Singleton might be one of the best running backs in the country when it's all said and done this season. He's, he's going to be that good. Um, and yeah, Kevon Lee's probably gonna start the year as a starter and Allen and Singleton potentially being the two best running backs on the roster is not a slight against Kevon Lee. Lee is a good back. You know, if he can, I know we touched on this last episode we did, Tim, where if you can get Lee back to being that power back that he was in 2020, 
with Singleton as the home run threat, and maybe Lee doesn't feel like he needs to do as much. Hey, give me the ball. I'll get four yards, bowl a guy over, fall forward, and let's do it again. There's a lot of value in that, especially in the goal line, especially in the red zone, especially in short yardage. So I think Penn State's running back room, I mean, last year there may not have been a single position on this team that disappointed more than the running backs. Um, but I do think this year the running backs can take a big step forward. Even if the offensive line doesn't take as big of a step forward as everyone's hoping, I think adding Lee to the picture, or excuse me, adding Singleton to the picture with his explosiveness, the ability to take a little crack and turn it into a big game, and with what we've seen from Katron Allen and keep on Lee, who for his warts last year still averaged what I think like four and a half yards a carry, something like that. It's not like he was a slouch when he had the ability to run the ball. So I do think running back will take a step forward this year for Penn State. And I do think a big part of it is the freshman you mentioned, Singleton and Allen, who you know, you're you're talking about two guys who, who just have a really bright future ahead of them. And with Singleton, a guy who has limitless potential running back, probably the best running back uh, in terms of pure talent that they have brought in since Saquon Barkley, which is, you know, any anyone who spends any time around Penn State, they, I feel like it's safe to say there's two players in the program you never want to compare anyone to. They're Saquon Barkley and LeVar Arrington. And it's been very difficult for a lot of people in the program to not compare Singleton to Saquon Barkley, which says something. And it's, it's funny, like you mentioned Saquon Barkley. Um, and I was watching a little bit, it caught the tail end of a replay of the 95 Rose Bowl on Big Ten earlier today. And, you know, seeing Kajana Carter just bust that first play for 80 plus yards for a touchdown, it just had me thinking, man, I, I so want to see Singleton or <laughs> Allen just do that, like, you know, at, at Purdue in a couple weeks and just, you know, get us excited about having a run a run game again. I mean, that was completely missing from the offense last year, which, you know, just very unusual, un-Penn State-like, if you ask me. I mean, I feel like you're going to at least see one 40-plus yard TD run in a season, and to have none like that was just something else. Um, but, yeah, I'm – I said, I'm, I, I really do think the when it's all said and done, uh, I think Singleton and Allen could be the top two running backs in the roster. But I would see Kevon Lee absolutely having having a role in the team, though. And I and I do anticipate him being a starter at Purdue. To be fair to to Kevon, but you know, Sing, Singleton and Allen just seem like guys that are way too talented to not give the lion's share of carries to them, uh, pun not intended. Uh, so uh, as, as the receivers, then there's no surprise who the top three are going to be there. Parker Washington, Kendrick Lambert Smith, and Mitchell Tinsley. But I'm intrigued to see what what's behind those guys. And, you know, Malik Mega seems to be having a good camp. Um, Caden Saunders especially is – made some strides since arriving on campus in January. And then uh, there's uh, Trey Wallace, who kind of a, kind of a guy who hasn't been talked about too much, but uh, he's a very athletic guy. He's kind of a guy who is kind of a late bloomer on the recruiting circuits. But, you know, I remember when they, when they got his commitment, he was being nabbed or being, um, being um, tabbed as like, as a great like get guy who by Penn state, just so, someone who's not being talked about much, but who could definitely blow up. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you look at Trey Wallace when he's on the recruiting trail, <clears throat> he didn't pick up his first power five offer until October of his senior year from Duke. He immediately committed to the blue devils shortly thereafter. Penn state offers Maryland offers Tennessee offers, um, I mean, Houston, who I realize Houston's not a Power 5 program, but especially for offensive players, Houston's more appealing than some Power 5 programs. They offered, and that's when his recruitment really blew up. And, um, yeah, the Nitty Lions flipped him, and I think that could be a huge gift for them. He's an athletic freak. Um, go watch some of his basketball highlights. The dude just can jump out of the building. It's insane. Great hands, super soft hands at receiver. I would not be surprised at all to see Trey Wallace kind of be that underrated guy who comes out of nowhere this year receiver. But for receivers as a whole, I feel pretty good about it for Penn State. Um, 
I mean, uh, thank you, Mark, for the kind words in the comments there. But uh, yeah, w- with the receiver group, I know we t- touched on the last show. That starting trio of Parker Washington, Mitch Tinsley, and Keandre Lambert Smith could be one of the best starting wide receiver groups in the Big Ten. If you look behind him, if Trey Wallace can reach his, start to take a step forward, reach his potential, Malik Mega can be that deep play threat. And if Caden Saunders, who has always been compared to KJ Hamler, if he can make a, any sort of impact like Hamler did early in his career, man, you could be in really good shape of receiver. And that, that's one of the reasons why I'm very cautiously optimistic about the offense. I still have my questions about the offensive line, but I think quarterback is a lot better situation than last year. And if Clifford is healthy and has kind of, you know, mastered this offense, has command of it, some of the weapons who have around him with an offense coordinator with the track record of Mike Yurcich, I just have a hard time seeing Penn State's offense not taking a big step forward from where they were last year. But I think to take a page from Franklin, um, I'm I'm not going to say anything about the O line. You know, we'll just <laughs> let's speak for itself. Yeah, we we've been yeah, heard that so many times in recent years, <laughs> and that's where my concern is. It's just if we get the same offensive line we saw last year, then just I, and I like I have a hard time believing that will happen. Like it's like the laws of average. Like they have to take a step forward. I feel from last season, but if somehow they don't, it could be another long year for the offense. Yeah, let's let's hope it's not the case. Um, uh, on the defensive side, uh, man, the more I just keep reading about the D line, you know, the more the more pumped I get for the start of the season. I, I'm really curious to see if if they're if they're if we have a much more uh, aggressive pass, more successful pass rush, one that can get to the quarterback more often, or at least scare the living daylights out of them, and you know, alter some passes, really mess up some offensive rhythms. Um, and again, I read, I was reading an article in on free about tonight and sudden chop Robinson, but you know, obviously it's currently you got Adisa Isaac, PJ Mustafer is back manning the middle, which I cannot emphasize how I'm sure you can't emphasize enough, just how huge that is. I mean, about as big as Sean Clifford coming back for his sixth year for the offense, just having that experienced, head up front like that. And then Hakeem Beam, I, I, I've always been talking about Hakeem Beeman coming back after missing all last year uh, for reasons still not explained. Um, but he stuck around and uh, he's, he's now f- uh, full go ready to go. And I mean, having him and Mustafer up front along with Isaac and, you know, a few other pass rushers, you know, it's, it's, I, I gotta say, I'm I'm definitely chomping at the bit to see how, you know, that that front four fares. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> you you look at Penn State's defensive line now compared to where they were entering the bowl game last year, for example. Entering the bowl game compared to what you have now, you do not have Adiza Isaac, PJ Mustafer, and Hakeem Beeman, who are likely three of your four starters. You throw in Chop Robinson, who's going to see a ton of playing time, and who by all accounts has been ahead of ahead of what they expected this year in camp. Deny Dennis Sutton, who was a five-star defensive end that Penn State had a fight, scratch, and claw to beat George and Bam for in their crew show for a reason. You throw him in the mix. And even like a guy like Jordan Vandenberg, who last year down the stretch of defense tackle really started to flash some nice things. You know, I think this defensive line group could be really strong this year, as you've mentioned. And <clears throat> I, I in, in today's college football, I think there's an argument to be made that outside of quarterback, there might not be a more important position than having a really strong defensive line. Because if you can blow the game up in the trenches and win the game in the trenches, I don't care who your quarterback is. I don't care who your running backs are. If your offensive line is getting whipped by the defensive line with regularity, you're not going to have success. I think Penn State's defensive line has the potential to be right up there with Ohio State for being the best in the conference this year, which would go a long way towards helping to – mask, hide, whatever term we to use, the potential issues at linebacker that could be a real concern this season. But, yeah, I think the defensive line, when you factor in getting Mustafa back, you get Beeman back, you get Isaac back, you add Chop Robinson, you add Deny Dennis Sutton, and then some of these guys like a Jordan Vandenberg, like a Kozai Izzard, like a Smith Vilbert, who towards the end of last year could really kind of see the lights starting to go on for them. I think it could go a long way this year too. 
Absolutely. Now, to be fair, they, they, I think the big the big concern, of course, is uh, linebacker. We've talked ad nauseum about this. I guess we'll talk about it one more time. Uh, I do like Curtis Jacobs. Obviously, he's hands down the best returning linebacker. And but you know that uh, that middle part of the middle part of the field is definitely a little concerning. It sounds like it's about between Ka- uh, Tyler Elson and Kobe King. You know, guys who I think are both capable of doing well in that spot. But of course we got to see them in some serious game action. And they got Jonathan Sutherland on the other side, uh, outside linebacker, um, which I guess it'll be interesting to see. Uh, we, you know, I, you know, I guess to put it kindly, uh, you know, not the most reliable safety, maybe it'll be a little better at <laughs> the linebacker spot. Still a little concern there though. But who knows? Maybe maybe the maybe the light comes on for him in you know his final year. But uh, and then the de- really concerned is just the depth behind that. So uh, you know you're just a couple injuries away from things getting pretty dicey, similar to what happened at quarterback and D line last year. So Marty, quick thoughts. Yeah, depth depth's definitely a big issue. Linebacker. I mean, you talk about Curtis Jacobs, who honestly might be the best player on this defense. Um, but behind him, you, there's a lot of question marks. Middle linebacker, Kobe King and Tyler Elsden, neither of them have a bunch of game experience. You mentioned you mentioned Jonathan Sutherland, who that's a player that I don't think any Penn State fan out there is going to have faith in until they see him prove them wrong, um, which hopefully he does, you know. But even behind those guys, you've got Dom DeLuca, who's a walk-on, who might be entrenched very firmly in the two deep this year so. It, my linebacker might be my biggest concern on the entire team. <clears throat> if they get one or two injuries in linebacker, they could be absolutely decimated at the position. And, you know, I, thankfully in today's college football, having the ability to have those linebackers who step up and stuff the run is not as important as it once was. Manny Diaz also runs a lot of four two five in his defense, which will help with it. But it's just hard to, it's hard to envision that the woes of linebacker are not costing Penn state at least one game this season. Unfortunately, I have to. I mean, I, I can see it, uh, and I, I guess I, uh, I want to spoil my schedule predictions. We're going to get into that later in the show, but I, there is one. I do have maybe one game in mind at least where I, that dicey linebacker situation could cost them. Uh, the secondary, though, once again, just like with the D line, I'm actually I, maybe even more than the D line feeling bullish about this group. I mean, you got. Johnny Brown back, Joey Porter Jr. Sounds like Johnny Dixon's made some serious strides in camp. So, like, I'm excited to – like, I think I saw the term third starting cornerback mentioned for him. Daquan Hardy really seems to be picking up where he left off at the end of last season. Uh, then, you know, can't forget Keaton Ellis. You know, he's he's been a key contributor at time, and, you know, he, I think he definitely, you know, continued to be so – so, uh, what's your, you know, what are your thoughts in the secondary, Marty? Yeah, I think the secondary could be one of the best in the history of the program, honestly. I mean, you look at, you get Joey Porter Jr. is a guy a lot of people thought was going to go pro after last year. He returns to one end, and everyone thought Kalen King would be the shoe in to start beside him. And for nothing, Kalen's done wrong. Like you said, Johnny Dixon apparently said it's a terrific camp and may be able to win that job. You have Daquan Hardy in the slot, who's a tremendous nickelback. Um, and you look back at safety, Tig Brown is quickly turning into one of the best safeties in the Big Ten. And beside him, you mentioned Keaton Ellis. Zaki Wheatley apparently has just been an absolute ball hawk in camp this year. Um, I know the staff is really high in Jalen Reed at safety. Incoming freshman K.J. Winston's a kid who the staff has high hopes for. So I think the secondary can be really, really good, which, you know, again, can really help if the linebackers aren't great, but the defensive line can step up and that secondary being able to lock receivers down and not have to worry about a lot of things probably can go a lot of way to fixing any warts we might see with this defense. Certainly. Um, I feel like with what Manny Diaz seems to emphasize, you know, the whole ball hawking, getting turned, going for the big turnover, you know, it, you know, I'm hopeful you'll you'll kind of see uh, maybe see even more interceptions than we saw last year. I mean, and frankly, you know, he saw 
I mean, Jair Brown, he had six of them last year. Also had a couple uh, fumble recoveries to go with it too. So it'll, I'm definitely excited to see what, what this group is capable of. And, you know, given the linebacker situation, uh, they may be relied upon a decent amount for run support. So we'll, they'll also be important in that aspect as well. Um, so I guess we want to dive, we can maybe dive in a little bit into the you know, recruiting world. Uh, so there's been some, some good news, bad news. I guess we can start with the bad news first. Uh, you know, uh, Tamarian Parker, top 100 defensive lineman who, from Alabama who surprisingly committed to Penn State a couple of months ago after having an excellent uh, visit up there. Uh, unfortunately, he's decommitted. Uh, and that's hard to sugarcoat that. It's definitely a tough loss. Um, not a guy you're, they're really going to be able to replace over the same caliber at this point in the cycle. But on the good news front, uh, they have found a, a solid replacement at quarterback after losing Marcus Stokes last month to Florida and Jackson Smolik, who previously been committed to Tulane, but then he blew up, especially in the camp circuit, had a nice showing at the Elite 11, took a visit to Penn State, worked out with the coaches. Coaches loved him enough to offer him, and uh, you know he, he loved them back. And apparently uh, he, he's been a Trace McSorley fan since he was a kid. And I don't know if he, if he knows this. I think I got a few more gray hairs just <laughs> only about that. But, uh, you know, Marty, your thoughts, just uh, you know, how important was it to – grab a kid like Smolik this late in the cycle after scrambling to fill in the gap left by losing your previous commit. Yeah, it's a tremendous job by James Franklin. I'm like, your it really is. You lose you lose a very, very talented quarterback of Marcus Stokes as late in the cycle as they did. And, you know, July might not sound like it's late in the recruiting cycle, but for quarterback, that's very late in the recruiting cycle. And replacing with a guy like Jackson Smolik, just great job. Um, Smolik, you mentioned the Elite 11. He actually outperformed uh, Marcus Stokes the Elite 11. Now, Stokes, in my opinion, still has the higher ceiling than Smolik, but Smolik's no slouch. You know, he 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 reads the defense really well. He's very good pre-snap. Um, and, and one thing with Smolik, too, to monitor, he battled a shoulder injury last year that really limited his arm strength and undoubtedly limited his recruitment. So if he is fully healthy this fall, I would not be surprised to see him did a ratings bump on recruiting boards. So yeah, it's just a good job by the staff. When you lose a quarterback that late in the cycle to be able to circle back and still land a kid who was an elite 11 quarterback and performed well at the elite 11. Great job, especially and this is something I think people overlook when you're coming off a cycle where you signed not just the number one quarterback in the country, but a guy in drew Aller who was, by some recruiting service, the number one overall player in the country, as well as another four-star in Bo Prabula, it's going to be very difficult to land a good quarterback in the following cycle, and Penn State managed to still do that in Jackson Smolik. Yeah, it's <clears> – <throat> I definitely think it's a huge pickup, but just just for depth purposes too. You know, you think about next year, you know, if, if, you know figure there will be a battle between Veyu and Drew Aller probably for the – starting job maybe bro for bill is a dark horse contender there but probably about fail you an hour but you know you throw in jackson smolik and on there you know as your fourth scholarship qb and you know it's hard to go hard to go wrong with that and he's a, he's a kid it seems like uh you know may not have the physical tools but from what it sounds like he's got the accuracy down and he's got the he's got the intelligence the ability to read the defense just it just has like that football IQ, which, you know, you can't teach that. That's uh, that's something he's got ingrained in him. So, you know, again, it'll it's a it's it's always good to you can never have too many people like him on your roster. So it's, you know, I gotta say it's a definitely a big pickup. And curious to see is there is there any I've been paying as close attention to recruiting as you do. Are there any other names that Penn State fans should? keep an eye on that might be committing down the road. Doesn't appear to be a ton at the moment. I mean, they're, they're going to look for another offensive tackle. They're going to look for another defensive lineman in this class. If another wide receiver came along and it was the right fit, they would go for it. But after adding Carmelo Taylor, a really speedster four star to Virginia, who 
I'm going to have a very difficult time the next few years not calling Carmelo Anthony. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they added him to help with the receiver class, which is big. So, yeah, I mean, th- this recruiting class, it's not going to be the potential top five class it once looked like, but it should still be a very solid top 15 type class. Um, definitely taking some blows here at the end, but you know, if you can add another offensive tackle, if you can add another quality defensive lineman, you've hit all your needs in this class and you're not going to complain. Um, just one name I would mention though, is Zion Tracy, a defensive back out of Connecticut. Um, same high school as former Penn state defensive back, Tyler Rudolph camp for the staff over the summer, ran a sub four, four forty. has an official visit scheduled for the Ohio game. The second week of September, um, it, it appears if Tracy put some good film on this year to start the year, the Nittany Lions will offer. And if they offer, I can't imagine him going anywhere else. So that could be one name to watch in the defensive back recruiting room. Oh, man, them fighting words, Joey Foster. Them fighting words. But uh, <laughs> I am looking forward to the renewal of the West Virginia Penn State series starting next year. Um, you know, because the last, what, 1992 is the last time I was, I was eight. Um, I kind of remember, but I've had to look it up on YouTube. To you were eight, it. I was one month old, so I definitely don't remember it at all. The last time Penn State and West Virginia played, yeah. So, yes, yeah, <laughs> literally the first time Marty can will even see those two teams playing in his lifetime. So, um, that he can that he you'll be able to remember at least. So, uh, that'll be interesting. Next year, it's in it's at Beaver Stadium next year, and then 2024, they. I believe it's a return trip to Morgantown. So I don't know. I, I only live a few hours away from Morgantown. So maybe I'll be making a road trip there. I'll be curious to see a game in that area. So anywho, uh, moving on the uh, to our season predictions here. We're just going to kind of kind of go through each game on the schedule. Yeah, give, us, give our own little thoughts and who we think is going to win. So we'll start, of course, with – uh, two and a half weeks from now, West Lafayette, Indiana, where eight o'clock kickoff Thursday night, Gus Johnson on the call on Fox, Penn State at Purdue. Um, Marty, I think you and I, we 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 kind of maybe we had similar thoughts about this when we we're discussing this in the uh, Black Shadari Slack channel, but I see it as a game where it's 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 close for about two and a half three quarters. You know, I think, uh, you know, Purdue will land – they'll definitely land a few haymakers, I'm sure, with Aiden O'Connell back there, quarterback, uh, slinging it around. Um, But I just feel like Penn State's talent and depth advantage, especially in the trenches, and even more specifically in the defensive trenches against Purdue's offensive trenches, I I feel that along with that secondary is going to – uh, prove to be a little too much as opposed to Purdue's defense causing problems for that Penn State offense. Uh, I just feel like it's a game that's maybe it's something like, you know, 21 17 late third quarter, but then Penn State kind of pulls away, ends up winning something like 35 24. Uh, what, you know, what are your thoughts about it? No, very similar to yours. You know, I could definitely see this being a game, you know, Five minutes to go in the third quarter, it's 21 to 17. And then Penn State outscores them 14 to 3, 17 to 7, something like that the rest of the way. And for the same reasons you said, I think Penn State's defensive line should be able to handle Purdue's offensive line pretty well. I don't think Purdue can run the ball very well, also. And I, the thing with Purdue, you look at Aiden O'Connell and that passing attack, it's very good. Don't get me wrong. But what did we talk about earlier? What are the strengths of Penn State's defense? The pass rush and the secondary. That matches up perfectly for Purdue. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a raucous blackout crowd in West Lafayette to start the year. I think the game will be close probably going into the fourth quarter, late third quarter, but in the end, Penn State pulls away. They get done. They beat Purdue to start the year 1-0. No, I, I don't think we're – I disagree. I don't think we're sleeping on yeah. Purdue. Uh, no. If Purdue if Purdue, beat, if Purdue wins that game, I'm not going to be surprised whatsoever. It wouldn't be a shocker, no. Yeah, but, I, no. I mean, I'm just – no, frank, frankly, I'll be shocked if, like, say, Penn State comes in and just, you know, blows them out from the start. Kind of like the game at Maryland. The Maryland field. game, yeah. That, I, I, I'll be shocked shocked that, that would be the shocking part. If it's like the 59 zip win over Maryland a few years ago, I'll be shocked by that. But, no, I mean, if Purdue ended up winning, 
I, I can see a scenario how that happens. Like, uh, you know, wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be the most shocking thing in the world, but if I'm just sitting back and thinking about it, just make knowing what I know. And just, I just think Penn state just has enough of a talent and depth advantage that it's going to show up late in the game when it matters most. Uh, but, you know, opening up on the row in the big 10 at night to start Start the season is no easy task. I mean, even if even if it's not as again, I've said even if this isn't as daunting as going at Wisconsin a year ago, it's still gonna be still gonna be a tough game. We're still gonna be clenching for most of it, I'm sure. But yeah, I think so. We both we both have Purdue, I mean we both have Penn State winning that one. Uh next up after that, uh, which is on a Saturday, September 10th, they play host to Ohio U, the Bobcats, uh, and I see this opponent. Of course, my my thoughts and probably your thoughts go back to ten years ago when they last played them. Yes. Which I was I was at that game, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, yeah, me too. Um, and that was just such a crazy, like you know, emotional game beforehand, and just and also just kind of you know, also just um, anticipation and curiosity because that was you know the first game under Bill O'Brien first game since, you know, the sanctions were levied against them and, you know, the, and all those upperclassmen stuck around despite being able to transfer freely to any school they could. Uh, so it was a very, definitely a lot of different emotions running through the fans of putting that one. And, uh, you know, it seemed like Penn state was going to take control there. They're up 14, three in the second half and looked like they're going to get an interception, but instead it, Bounces off, uh, I think it's Stephen Obey. Yeah, but Stephen Obey has into a hands, yep. high receiver right behind him who scores a touchdown. And that just, you could just feel the momentum just. Mm -hmm. you, you felt everything come out of Beaver Stadium on that exact play. And it was all down from there. Ohio went on to win 24 uh, 14. Now, this is not, this is not the Ohio, I mean, Ohio team from 10 years ago. That was actually a pretty good good one that challenged for a Mac title. And, you know, this group, they're coming off a three and nine season with um, at the time was in, you know, it was, was a head coach who kind of got thrust into things last minute because uh, the legendary Frank Solich abruptly retired uh, last summer. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, and obviously the t Penn state's talent and depth is light years ahead of where it was 10 years ago compared, you know, compared to that. So I, I, yeah, this, this ought to be, I say this is the easiest game on the schedule for Penn State. Uh, you know, one that's hopefully it's over at halftime or at least it's over by midway for the third quarter. So you can rest the starters. Um, Marty, any thing you want to add to that or. No, I agree. I think one of the easiest games on the schedule, I think no matter what they roll in this game and, you know, one thing I will say about this game that could be fun to watch, this might be the first time we get to see Drew Alar, a quarterback. We might get to see that. You know, at least once this year, he's going to have that just spectacular, beautiful 50-yard bomb to somebody, and it wouldn't surprise me if it's in this game. Yeah, we shall see. So, of course, we both have Penn State winning that one. Next up, after, week after that is at Auburn. Uh, it's a 3.30 game on CBS. Uh that, and this is one where maybe we'll, boy, I, I go back and forth in this one, Marty. And um, man, I, I guess on, you know, I, I know it was a chaotic off season for Auburn. You know, there was some sort of coup attempt by the boosters against Brian Harson. I mean, Harson was in Mexico when this was happening, you know, it was really crazy. Uh, Harson survived it for now. And, well, they did lose some some key guys to the transfer portal. They lost both of their offensive defensive coordinators from last year, so they have new coordinators. But they do have Tank Bigsby back, and I cannot get the images out of my head of Tank Bigsby running all over that that defense last year. And uh, when I look at the linebacker situation, Penn St I mean, I was mentioning before like how there's a game I could see them losing because of that. This is the one I'm thinking of. Um, now, that, that being said, 
I can certainly see Penn State going in there and winning, maybe you know, winning convincingly, perhaps by a couple scores. But I guess I just feel a little uneasy going on the road in the SEC in mid-September. Probably crazy humid down there. Obviously, a rabid crowd, and you know they got a beast of a running back who trampled over Penn State last year. And frankly, I'm still baffled as to why Auburn just didn't continue to feed him the rock when it was clear Penn State didn't have an answer for him. Um, the outcome could have been different last year, perhaps if they had done that. But I've, right now, gun to my head, I I I think Auburn pulls it out in a close one. Now, I could potentially change my mind on this when the week of the game comes, depending on how the first two games go. But, you know, for right now, though, I, I'm I'm going to have to say Auburn gets the dub. Yeah, this is the this is going to be the first disagreement we have. I, I, I think Penn State pulls it out. I agree linebacker scares me here. Um, I also have a game on the schedule pegged. I think they'll lose because of the linebackers, and it's not this one, so we will get to it. Um, I, I do think though with Tank Bigsby, he's a very good back. Don't get me wrong, but I think this is one of those games where getting PJ Mustafer back, getting Hakeem Beeman back, getting Adiza Isaac back. I, I think this is one of those games where you see that pay off. I also think Auburn right now is just a real, they're a dumpster fire, man. Like I, I don't think anyone in their administration, the BOT, whatever it is, wants Brian Harson to be the coach. Um, I think Brian Harson knows that. And I think as a fortune, I think Brian Harson is a good football coach. And as Auburn's a terrible call, I think it's very similar to Joe Moorhead in Mississippi state. Very good coach, terrible cultural fit. Um, so I, I think that's there. I think they know it. I think that helps. I don't think it's going to be an easy win. I could see this being like a 17 to 13 gritted out rock fight kind of win. But in the end, I think Penn State pulls this one out and they're 3-0, which, hey, if you can get 3-0 with road wins at Purdue and Auburn as soon as your first three, they're, I don't care if you're Penn State or freaking like Alabama, man. You'll take that if that's if that's your first three games on your schedule. Well, I, I sure hope you're right on that one, Marty. Um, you know, time will, time will tell. We're about a month away from that happening. So I'm definitely intrigued. It's, it's one of the more intriguing games in the schedule to me because I, I generally – waffle back and forth on how that one's going to go. So, so that, so got a little disagreement here for once on that, on the schedule. Uh, moving on, uh, final game in September, they host central Michigan. And uh, while this is a game Penn State should certainly win, uh, this will, this will not be this an easy one. I would say they, they're going to have to, they're going to have to show up and still bring, you know, at least their their B game if they want to win this one comfortably enough. Because uh, Central Michigan is one of those teams that's projected the challenge for a MAC title. Uh, Jim McElwain's done a fine job uh, rebuilding that program, especially after got dismissed from Florida. So, uh, Marty, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with everything you said. Not going to be an easy win considering it's a MAC opponent. Um, good team can win the MAC. Jim McElwain's a good football coach. I can see this definitely one of those games, you know, middle of the second quarter, Penn State's kind of him hawing around. It's like 14 to 10, something like that. People getting antsy. And then Penn State winds up putting a couple of drivers together to make it like 28 to 10. And Central Michigan never gets super close. So I, I do think this is a game where, especially coming off of the Auburn game, it's a real letdown opportunity where I could see Penn State kind of sleepwalking through their first two, two and a half quarters, but in the end, they'll pull away and probably win this one by double digits. I would tend to agree there. So, so we got, so, so thus far I have Penn state being three and one at this point, you know, Penn state four and zero, oh. going into the big 10, sorry, not big 10, big 10 home opener against Northwestern October 1st. Um, I'd say if Ohio is the easiest non-conference opponent, I think Northwestern is the easiest Big Ten opponent on the schedule. Of course, I said the same thing about Illinois a year ago, and look how that turned out. <laughs> yeah, but I'll mention that game. Northwestern does not – at least I'm saying they don't seem to have the – or at least they're not fully committed to pounding the rock 50 times a game like Illinois seems to be with Brett Bielema running the show. 
but this is this is a Northwestern team. It's uh, they uh, they had a they had a great 2020 season, got to the Big Tw- Big Ten championship game, but that's sandwiched in between a pair of three and nine seasons before and after that, and it doesn't seem like things are going to be much better this year for the Wildcats. Uh, Phil Steele, the magazine next to me, he's got, he's projecting him to be dead last in the big 10 West. So it's kind of, that's kind of why I say this, this is a game Penn State should win handily enough. Um, I don't, you know, I I just don't see any real big play threats here for the Wildcats that are going to give Penn State fits. And, you know, again, I just think the, Talent, death is just going to overwhelm Northwestern. No, I totally agree. I think Northwestern is probably the worst team in the Big Ten this year. Definitely the worst team in the Big Ten West. I think Penn State wins this one easily. Um, yeah, it's just – and I think Pat Fitzgerald's a very good football coach. Don't get me wrong. It's just I don't think Northwestern has the horses this year to keep up with many teams in the Big Ten, especially Penn State. I think the Nittany Lions roll this one and – on, on my projected schedule, they're five and zero heading into the bowl week or heading into the bye week. Excuse me. Yes, and speaking of the bye week, and he, as there's a bye week after Northwestern, and use this moment. Uh, thank you, Tim Prangley, for pointing this out. If you, if you like what you see, uh, you, uh, please hit that like and subscribe button, um, both on the Voice of College Football channel, also especially on our Penn State channel, which we're trying to grow. Uh, we're as I saw, we're pretty close to 500 followers. Well, let's see if we can get that to 500 before September 1st in the season opener against Purdue. I think we can do this, folks. Uh, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> so uh, moving on. So after the bye week comes a trip to the big house to take on Michigan. And uh, this, oh, this is a series that's been – uh, the games have been pretty well played over the last few years. Um, they've all been decided within um, within 10 points. Uh, obviously, Michigan last year scored a late touchdown to win it. Year before that, uh, two teams gritted out. Uh, Penn State got a 10-point win. 2019, Penn State jumped out to a 21 nothing start, but Michigan claws their way back. They have a chance to tie it and force overtime late in the game, but Penn State comes up with a with a fourth and goal stand and hangs on to win. So uh, I I would say this is I think this is going to be another another dog fight somewhere the last few years. Um, I just I don't know Mich- Michigan. This I say this. I don't think I've seen this much offensive firepower in a Michigan team in some time. Uh, you got capable pair of quarterbacks, K. McNamara, J.J. McCarthy. Uh, I think Blake Quorum and Donovan Edwards are a solid running back duo. Uh, receiver, you know, Ronnie Bell's back. Um, I'm assuming he'll be he can stay healthy this time. And uh, then you got Cornelius Johnson behind him. Um, Eric All at tight end. You know, decent O line. So that's a team that just loves to pound the rock on you, which was, you know, again, my concerns about the linebacker situation. Uh, I can certainly see that being an issue at, at, at Michigan. And uh, I think it would probably would be enough. Um, I know the defense of Michigan, they've lost so many key starters, including David Ojabo and Aiden Hutchinson up front. And I understand there's no replacing those two. That being said, um, they've recruited well enough. They should they should have talented enough people to replace them with, even if it's not as good as last year. Um, I could certainly see – I could see how Penn State potentially wins this game, but I have a hard time predicting it right now. I, I think Michigan – I'm thinking Michigan pulls it out, probably like a 7- to 10-point Michigan win. Yeah, this was the game I had pegged as, as Penn State losing largely to the linebacker core. Their rushing attack of Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards I think will be too much, especially in the big house. Um, I'd love to see Penn State win it, um, not just because it's Penn State, but uh, my, my, my oldest son, his best friend is Blake Corum's cousin, and I know his aunt and uncle really well. So for the, for the bragging rights aspect of it, it would be nice to pull this one out. 
on a personal front, but I, I can't see it happening. I think they go to the big house. I think they play a good game. Like you said, dog fight, 27 to 24, 24 to 21, something like that. But I think the Nittany Lions come up short and suffer their first loss of the season when they go to the big house. Indeed. Uh, and then that brings us into an interesting sandwich game. I, I call it for lack of a better term. Uh, they, Penn State goes back home to host Minnesota for the whiteouts. Uh, not your typical Big Ten whiteout opponents, but part of the reason for that is because this is already this is a game that already been pegged for a 7:30 start, and uh, the even though Ohio State is a week later at home, that's pegged for a noon start on Fox. And so I I know we talked about this in the last show. We both applauded the move to keep the whiteout a nighttime game, even if it meant. It wasn't going to be against Ohio State, uh, so I'm 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 normally uh, we know how this team is coming off uh, off a loss. Uh, they they tend to they tend to kind kind of have struggled the following week and maybe lose a dumb game, which we saw last year against Illinois, and uh, you know here in this case. You know, you you would think maybe Minnesota could come in and take advantage of Penn State coming off a loss, but I feel like this being the whiteouts, crowd's gonna be fired up, teams gonna be fired up. And I know the Minnesota players, uh, they've all said at Big Ten Media Days how excited they were to play in the in the whiteouts. But it's one thing when you're you know, to be excited for it, but when you're actually there and you're dealing and you're experiencing the 107,000 plus fans wearing white, just screaming at the top of their lungs, and you're struggling to get the play call going. Uh, there's just look at the YouTube video sometime from the 2019 whiteout against Michigan. Uh, first play, uh, Michigan Harbaugh had to burn a timeout because they could not get the play off without getting a delayed game. So. Be, you know, it's it's going to be a different kind of atmosphere than what what they've exper- probably experienced before. Uh, that being said, um, Minnesota certainly has a team capable of coming in and and pulling off the the win. Uh, you know, they, Tanner Morgan's back for his sixth year, and, and he's reunited with his old coordinator, Kirk Shiraka, Who, yes, there's also a, a personal element here because. Kirk Shiraka was Penn State's coordinator in 2020 and then was let go when Mike Yersich became available because Franklin wanted Yersich all along and he wasn't quite satisfied with how the offense looked under Shiraka. So I'm sure there's a little personal revenge matter in there too. And they got, you know, another a solid running back, uh, Mo Ibrahim. And uh, as, as I said before, you know, the, you know, the r- lack of, you know, the linebacker depth is a concern when it comes to stopping the run. So you know, it could end up being an issue there, but I do think Penn state rides the whiteout crowd. I, and I think the offense will, by that point, they should mid season, they should be starting to click on all cylinders and, and should be enough to, you know, to, get the win, something like a 7-14 to point win under the whiteout lights. Yeah, I think that's about exactly how I feel. Obviously, you have concerns about me, Mo Ibrahim against against the linebacker group. And that Kirk Shiraka storyline, it's really something. I mean, you go back to the last time these two teams played in 2019, and you have Kirk Shiraka and Tanner Morgan carving up Brent Pry's defense. Well, since then, Brent Pry's at Virginia Tech. Kirk Shiraka went to Penn State to be offense coordinator for a year, spent a year at West Virginia as an analyst back in Minnesota. And somehow the quarterbacks from that game, Tanner Morgan and Sean Clifford, are still in college because of the COVID role. Um, yeah, and I think even Penn State, you you have a lot of motivation. That Minnesota game, if the turf monster does not get Jahan Dotson <laughs> or if Daniel George is not called for the most phantom offensive pass interference call in the history of football, you probably win that game. And 
at 11 and one with your only loss being a one score loss in Columbus to an undefeated Ohio state team. You very well may have snuck into the playoff as the four seed that year. If you take care of business in Minnesota. So I think there's a lot of motivation on Penn state's end. Also, um, like you said, the whiteout crowd, Minnesota will match up both Penn state's defense because their ability to run the ball, but Penn state is the better all around team, the more talented team in the end. I think Penn state gets it done 10 to 14 points. They beat the Gophers in front of the whiteout crowd. And at that point it's full steam ahead to full steam head to the Buckeyes the following Saturday. Yeah. I, I think, I think they'll pull out the win, but again, uh, we shall see. It's normally we do think of it as a trap game, but just with the with the fact it's a whiteout, um, I think that kind of negates the trap part of it. Um, but it, it's I'd say after Auburn, it's probably the other game that I'm most I'm most intrigued by. Just some not entirely sure how that's going to play out. Um, although I guess I'm a little more sure about Penn State winning than at Auburn, but still I, there's definitely a myriad of ways it could play out if you ask me, uh, which brings us now to Ohio state the following week. Uh, also at home going to be Fox's big noon kick game. Um, I would guess it's probably going to be the stripe out game. If Minnesota is going to be the whiteout. So they'll do some kind of out for Ohio state. Um, it should have, you know, I think, I think a safe bet to make is Penn state will absolutely uh, bring it to Ohio state in, in terms of giving them a hard time. Um, but I just think Ohio state that, that offense is a national championship caliber offense are bringing in. And if that defense, uh, if Jim Knowles can get that defense cleaned up, I mean, they're going to be a title contender. And um, I think you know, Penn state can definitely play them close, but I, kind of like I was talking about with Purdue earlier, I just think Ohio State's come like late third quarter, early fourth quarter, they just – they kind of start to take over the game a bit, take over the game and just uh, ultimately stave off Penn State. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I think Ohio State might have the best offense in the country this year. I think they're worst, the number three team in the country between Alabama and Georgia. Um I, I think the Buckeyes not just make the playoff. I think they wind up playing for a national championship this season. So, yeah, I'm with you. I think it'll be close for most of the game. The crowd will keep them in it. Penn State always plays Ohio State tough. We have definitely have seen Penn State teams where the talent gap between them and Ohio State was greater than this team, and they you know, still kept the close. I think that'll be the case. But in the end, too much offense from Ohio State. I think they probably win it by 7-10, to 10, probably get a late score, that maybe makes it a little more lopsided than it is, but yeah, I think the Buckeyes get it done. Yeah, I think we're both in agreement there. So, uh, moving on to the November slate, uh, they the week after Ohio State, they have to go to Indiana, and I guess maybe normally, geez, I would be concerned as heck about this one being a big letdown game. And yeah, you know how usually after a tough loss, the team has a hangover going into the following week. And that a lot of times that ends up being a loss. Um, I would normally feel the way about Indiana, but for some reason, and, and th- of course this could, you know, I could look like a complete idiot for saying this now when in August and when it comes to November, but uh, I just don't, just on this Indiana team just doesn't scare me like like a road game in Indiana. You know it's going to be competitive. Like they always give Penn State a tough time, Bloomington. But I'm not like deathly afraid of Penn State being an upset victim this time around. Um, and maybe it's maybe it's just recency bias because of uh, how anemic they looked last season offensively and just defensively how they, you know, Penn State didn't have too much trouble throwing on them at least. Um, I don't know. I just, I just feel like this is a game that Penn State should be able to take care of business and ultimately, um, you know, they'll, Indiana will, will hang tough, but I just, I, don't know, I just don't feel like there's 
big of a threat as they've been in recent years. No, I agree. Um, <clears throat> Penn State at Indiana is a game that Penn State fans have always kind of shaked in their boots about because even, even when Penn State has gone there and taken care of the Hoosiers, it's never been easy. That said, I think this year Indiana is not, not the team they've been in recent years. Um, they don't worry me as much. And now I will say under James Franklin, Penn State has not always been very good. The week after Ohio State, I think they're – in his tenure, there's something like one and seven against the spread and like two and six overall the week after the Ohio state game, something along those lines. But I think they get it done. I think they win it pretty easily. Cause I, I just don't think Indiana is going to be very good this year. Yeah. I, I would have had to say the same. And again, I can, we can both potentially look foolish uh, in a couple of months for saying this. Maybe Indiana does surprise people uh, with, you know, if Connor Bazelak, a quarterback, or maybe they find some new studs at receiver, or maybe they even get a run game. We'll see. But uh, India should be an improved team. I mean, because it can't get any worse than 2-10 and 10 last year, but it still strike me as probably like a 4-5 to five win team, uh, you know, improved, but, you know, not a team that's I'm feeling threatened by at the moment. Uh not as threatened as maybe I'm feeling a bit by the next opponent on the schedule, which is Maryland at home. And now I do think I do think Penn State pulls out the win, but I will say if uh, Talia Tungavailoa and Maryland's bevy of receivers, uh, Raheem Jarrett, um, Jacob Copeland, the Florida transfer came in, uh, Dante Demas, who got injured last year, was available for Penn, against Penn State. And then uh, Deshaun Jones, uh, those guys, the, if especially if those receivers stay healthy, and of course Talia has to stay healthy too. If Talia goes down, then you know that whole Maryland season probably goes uh, spiraling downhill. But if they're all healthy, um, it'll definitely be a it'll definitely be a challenge for the sec Penn State secondary. Uh, because I, I feel like that's the strongest part about Maryland on paper. Now, everything else about them seems like a huge question mark, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, I think Penn State, you know, even if I think even if it's like a shootout type of game, it's a it's a game I think Penn State uh, could even win in a shootout against them. Um, but uh, Marty, any thoughts? No, I agree. I think it's a game. It's not going to be an easy game. Uh, Penn State is always Maryland Super Bowl, which is also something to take in consideration. And like I said, the best part about the Terps is their passing attack. Um, and I think Penn State, you know, we've talked about their secondary. We've talked about the potential pass rush. We'll match up well against that. I don't think it'll be easy. I could see this game with a lot of body blows going back and forth, potentially high scoring. But in the end, I think Penn State gets it done and they beat Maryland. And then following week they go at Rutgers, uh, who, you know, Greg Schiano has done a doing a good job uh, rebuilding that program, install instilling the uh, old culture he had going when he was there the last time. Um, but uh, this is a you know this is a team where, I mean, look until they actually do it, I I, I can't bring myself to, I can't see myself ever predicting. Penn State losing to them until it actually does happen. Um, I know a couple of my our colleagues predicted a loss last year when against them, especially when the flu was ripping for the team. And the fact that they were still able to beat them 28 zip despite missing a bunch of key guys from the flu. Uh, and with Sean Clifford being completely ineffective, I mean, that's where, you know, Christian Veyu came on to the came to the fans' consciousness for the first time had himself a nice game spelling for Cliff and sort of Malik Mega introduced himself to the Penn State faithful with his nice touchdown catch. So it's, I mean, it's a game where, you know, it could be like one of those, you know, sleepy starts. He's kind of let them hang around, but you know, they're not really a threat to pull off the win, but you know, it's a game at Penn State just, you know, they, they just use that, the talent, sheer talent advantage to win that one. 
Yeah, no, I agree. If, like, if, if Rutgers couldn't beat Penn State last year when Penn State was, what, 7-4, and 7-3, and three, whatever it was, and most likely completely checked out on the season and being wrecked by a flu bug and they still couldn't get it done, or the year prior in Piscataway when Penn State was 1-5 and five and, again, completely checked out on the season. If they couldn't win those, yeah, it's until Rutgers beats Penn State, I don't think they'll ever have the opportunity to do it. Give me the Nittany Lions and probably by double digits, maybe more. Yeah, I would, t- I would tend to agree. And now this brings us to the season finale at home against Michigan State. Uh, it's a game that last year, I don't know about you, like, produced a lot of frustration for me. I can remember just screaming, throw the effing ball. Throw the, ball, throw the, ball, yeah. throw the yeah, damn throw ball. The ball. I mean, I just, I, I couldn't, I mean, I mean, I was getting pissed off in real time because every time they would just go to the run because Michigan State secondary literally had no answer for the passing attack in the snow. I mean, they should have slinged it 70 times that game if necessary. But, you know, enough to on in the past. Uh, I really don't know. It's hard to say. You don't know what the t- – obviously you don't know what the team's record is going to be or exact or who's going to be healthy or what the morale is going to be like on either side at this point at that point in the season. But I will say if, I guess if Sean Clifford's he's healthy, you know, the, the team for the most part is healthy. Um, man, I, I, I cannot see Cliff going out in his final game at Beaver stadium as a loser in this one. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure the team, you know, is pretty ticked off about what happened last year. They probably felt they should have gotten the win in East Lansing and they'll want to try and finish the job. Now, Michigan state, I'm not sure what, what to think of them. Uh, I know, you know, once again, Mel Tucker's hit the portal hard and, uh, you know, and, and obviously he's a very capable coach. He and his staff do a good job uh, coaching up the talent they bring in. So, I mean, we'll see. I, I, I guess gun to my head, I think Penn state in a close one, what what about you, Marty? This, this is a tough one for me. Um, I agree with everything you said. Absolutely everything you said. That said, when we did our Black Sheet Diary predictions a few weeks ago, I predicted Penn State to go 9-3. and three. Um, With what we've done here tonight, I have them at 9-2 and two coming into this one. <laughs> Michigan State has always been a bugaboo for the Nittany Lions. Um Give me Michigan State in a close game. I, I just I think Penn State winds up nine and three. I don't know necessarily how they're going to get there, but I, I think they wind up there. And like I said, Michigan State just it's always been a bugaboo for Penn State. I mean, you look at 2017 and 2018 both. I, I realize those games are a little bit different because they're coming off of just crushing defeats to Ohio State. But they were those are years Penn State was a better team and lost. Last year, Penn State was probably a better team than Michigan State. Um, definitely a better matchup with Michigan State, who was wrecked by the flu bug and couldn't cover anything in the secondary, and Penn State still found a way to loss. Um, yeah, Michigan State, going back to the days of D'Antonio, seemed to have Penn State's number. It irks me so much. There are a few <laughs> programs I despise more than them, largely because of Mark D'Antonio and Pat Narduzzi. But, yeah, I, I think the Spartans – give me the Spartans in a close one, and I have the Nittany Lions finishing the regular season at 9-3. and three. And I will say going 9-3 and three after the last two seasons would be a huge step in the right direction for Penn State of kind of getting this thing back on the track that we saw from 2016 through 2019. Well, absolutely from, you know, for what feels like a transition-y type year to me, 9-3 and three would be excellent. And – um, those of you who have been keeping track, we have, we're both projecting nine and three season for Penn State, although they both have losses to Michigan, Ohio State. But that third loss, I have it to Auburn, you have it to Michigan State. You know, we'll, I guess we'll, time will tell, you know, if we're right, which one of us is right, or, or hopefully, you know, I guess maybe I'm, hopefully I'm wrong about Auburn and you're wrong about Michigan State. That would be the dream. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. But, uh, now I will, I will say if one of us are going to be right, I prefer it be you because I would much I can much more stomach a loss at Auburn than home against Michigan State. So I think for me, Mark, it's just 
Yeah, I, I also don't want to predict Penn State going getting swept by the Michigan schools again. Like yeah. we're, we're going 0 and 3 against OSU. Yeah, go, go 0 and 3 against the other big three in the Big Ten East is something that's happened far too much under James Franklin. Um, probably the like single biggest deterrent to it to the program since he's been here. So no, I can definitely feel that. Well, let's see. Last year, well, last year was the first time since 2018 that they went 0 and 3 against that group. So, you know, I'm hopefully that, uh, that you know they at least win one of those this year. So, time will tell. Though, again, that's a it always it gets more difficult to predict a game like that. That's at the end of the season because obviously as we know injuries happen. You know, they you know just certain players um, end up hitting their stride mid-season who you didn't see hitting their stride. And that can go both ways, either for Penn State or against Penn State, depending on the opponent. So, yeah, we'll see. None of the records are going to be, obviously, by that point, who's going to be up for the game, who's not. So, but, yeah, hopefully I'm I'm right predicting with my prediction on Michigan State. So, we'll see. I, I do see a lot of comments about, uh, you know, Mel Tucker – you know, getting lucky at the portal and I can't have that kind of luck uh, every single year. I guess we'll see. I I can see where you guys are coming from. Uh, I, I guess it's an interesting, I guess it's an interesting experiment what Mel Tucker's doing, hitting the portal so hard, you know, on a yearly basis. Um, I guess we're going to find out next couple of years, whether that's a sustainable strategy or not in this era of portaling. So anyway, on to, on to your uh, viewer questions. Thank you for being patient and sticking around with us. Um, we will start. Let's we'll start with you, Mike. Three eighty three. Uh, his concern: Penn State hardly gets any breaks. We won't have games this schedule. Um, what are the realistic expectations? Already, what do you think? What do you think would be realistic expectations for the fan base? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I think they go nine and three. Um, I, I can understand Mike's point of view, though. I definitely think there's a scenario where you see this team be better than last year and still wind up like eight and four because that schedule's tough, especially out of the gate. You know, like we mentioned earlier, at Purdue and at Auburn, this two is your first three games, and then have a three game stretch of at Michigan and then come home and play Minnesota and Ohio State. That's not easy. Um, so yeah, I think this team could take a step forward. And wind up eight and four. But I think as a Penn State fan, a realistic expectation, I would say nine and three. I think they go nine and three. And to be 11 11 the last two years to bounce back and put together a nine and three season, uh, as I said, I think, I think that's a step in the right direction for Penn State. Certainly. I I guess I'm being hope. You know, my prediction is also, it's also part about trying to be hopeful about the future, too. I, I'm being nine and three would, uh, of course, I was. I think I was thinking eight and four for the longest time. But then, you know, the closer you get to the season, you know, the, I think you naturally, especially when you read good practice reports, you, you know, you drink a little more of the Kool Aid, and then you want to up your prediction by at least one win. So, nine and three feels about right to me, though, um, given how transitioning things feel. Uh, Manny C asks, "What's the biggest battle to be starter on the defensive side?" Middle linebacker, maybe. I would be thinking that. I also, my thought was actually, um, who's the starting cornerback opposite of Joey Porter Jr.? Yeah, that's a good call too. The camp Johnny Dixon has had. I, I would, I would, from what I've been reading about Johnny Dixon, I, I would guess maybe Johnny Dixon wins that job. But yeah, I think middle, but Marty said middle linebacker, and also, um, with who starts a corner besides Joey Porter Jr. Also, actually, I'm curious to see who the other, who the other edge guy is opposite of Adisa Isaac. I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be Nick Tarburton, or do you think uh, maybe someone else like Chop Robinson or maybe – I think first – snap, I think first snap of the game, most games, Tarburton's going to be out there. That doesn't mean Tarburton plays the second most snaps next to Isaac. You know what I mean? But I do think Tarburton's probably your your quote unquote starter most games. Which kind of well, we've kind of answered this a bit. But how's a twenty two linebacker room looking? Uh, 
Yeah. Um, say a prayer. Yeah, say a prayer. Not good, Bob. Trying uh, <laughs> question mark. Um, I mean, we, what was it before you? I think Curtis Jacobs will be will be a stud. Um, after that, it's we'll we'll see. There's some guys who younger guys who are promising. I know we talk about Tyler Ellis and Kobe King battling it out. Uh, I've also been re- from I've read uh, uh, current fresh true freshman Abdul Carter has been making strides in practice, and he's kind of a dark horse candidate to hit the two deep and be a part of the linebacker rotation. And, you know, again, if there's a couple of injuries, he, he'll probably get thrown into the fire out of necessity. So I think you're going to see a lot of younger guys uh, get some playing time at linebacker. But, yeah, I'd say – I've said this before in other shows, but this is the position that concerns me the most. Um, it's not even the O-line that concerns me most. It's, it's the linebackers. You know, I agree. Linebacker is a huge concern. Um, early reports on Abdul, Car- on Abdul Carter, excuse me, do seem promising, which is nice because I think Carter could be a really good player, a real athletic freak for Penn State's defense in the coming years. But, yeah, the, that linebacker room is – you and I both mentioned it. We both think it cost them at least one game this year, and uh, hopefully that's it. And, and one thing I will say, too, about linebacker, I think it's kind of unfortunate – Curtis Jacobs is might be the best, not just line, not just defensive player on this team, might be the best football player on this entire roster. And I feel like it's going to really get lost this year because with how porous linebacker could be, and Jacobs is going to be asked to do a lot, and teams are going to target, hey, he, he's the guy we're not going to let beat us on defense. I do think that how just how talented and skilled and good Curtis Jacobs really is may not shine through this year because of the rest of that linebacker room. I guess we'll follow that up with uh, Landras, who starts at free safety, Ellis, Wheatley, Reed. I know he touched upon this a bit earlier in the show. Um, I know he said Zaki Wheatley has been showing uh, great signs of progress as well as Reed. Um, I guess I would still be inclined to say Keaton Ellis. He's the most experienced in the bunch. But I don't know. Maybe you disagree on that, Marty. No, I agree. I think when they go to West Lafayette on the first, Ellis is your starter. Um, he might not be your starter in the middle of the season, but I think Ellis is a starter to begin the year. But regardless, I think Ellis Wheatley, Jalen Reed, I think we see a lot of all three of them. So in the end, uh, it's one of those similar to Tar Burton at defensive end. Yeah, you're going to have your quote-unquote starter, but I could see all three of them playing pretty pretty equal snaps most games. Indeed. Um, get to Mark. Thank you for the $5. Uh I would really goes to the transfer portal, but they did want Hunter Norris at how's he how's Hunter doing? Um, from what I've I was reading in one of the um, on three articles, it sounds like he's I think it sounds like he's one of the starters. Actually, I do have a thing opened up on my screen. Let me da, da, da. or I'm sorry, he was uh well, may not predicted starter, but he's definitely on that too deep. Uh he'll definitely be a part of the key part of the rotation if he's not starting. Yeah, I mean, it looks like there's a possibility Sal Warmly, who was supposed to be starter at right guard last year before getting hurt, could be the starter. Um, like you said, regardless, Norzad is going to play a lot um, and should be a really good depth piece for the Indy Lions as well as a good veteran presence. And, you know, with how, with how poor Penn State's offensive line has been in recent years, you'll, you'll take all the help you can get in guys like Hunter Norzad. Absolutely. And of course, no show of ours is complete without questions about James Franklin. Uh, CZM asks, are Penn State fans happy with them? I'm thinking his coaching costs you guys some games. So, uh, well, I'm not going to get an argument from me on the second part of that statement, but uh, yeah, our fans happy with Franklin in general. I mean, yeah, there's a vote. Look, there's always, there's a, there's always like a vocal group on, the internet that's that's gonna complain. It's not you know it's not gonna be having them. Probably want him gone. All that want him fired. Um, you know, I again, I think most, I think most of the fan base uh, appreciates what he brings to the table uh, as far as recruiting, as far as being a good ambassador for the program, for the university as a whole. Um, 
you know, I've, obviously the frustrations are really more of just what happens, you know, on some Saturdays in the fall. Um, if they can, obviously, if they can get those patched up, I think you'll see the opinions or you'll see less, less, um, uh, less clamoring on for his firing from certain portions of the fan base. But uh, Marty, I know you've, you've been kind of off and on on Franklin. Uh, I'm sure it'll change. It'll be the same way again as the season goes on, but um, you know, your thoughts. Yeah. You know, I've always said with James Franklin for, you know, December through August, you could not ask for a better coach, better representation, whatever it is of your program than James Franklin, which is a lot more than most college football programs can say in their head coach. Um, the dude kills it in recruiting. He understands, the, you know, forming these bonds with families. He understands the PR stuff. He gets it all. Game day, yes, he, he leaves some things to be desired, um, especially with clock management. Could you do better with a game day coach than James Franklin? Yes. That said, is he a top 10 to 15 coach in the country? That's also an absolute yes. And I know this is something we have talked about ad nauseum in our Black Shoot Irish chat. And something I have not always completely agreed with, but probably have come around to agree with you more with is, is Penn state going to do better than James Franklin? Probably not. So it's one of those. And I will say too, I think James Franklin is a coach who is cut out perfectly for NIL stuff because he just gets that aspect of things. And now that you have a, a athletic director in Pat Kraft, who seems to be locking step with James Franklin, a new school president seems to be locking step with Kraft and Franklin in the football program. I think that bodes well for Penn State also. But yeah, I mean, every coach is going to have their faults. I mean, you look at Dabo Sweeney. There, there are a lot of comparisons between James Franklin and Dabo Sweeney's head coaches. The difference is Dabo Sweeney had his Deshaun Watson. He had his Trevor Lawrence and got his national titles as a result. And I know this is something else we've talked about. Drew Aller could be Penn State's Deshaun Watson because Clemson was always Clemson until they weren't. And we could see a scenario where Penn State was always Penn State until they weren't. Precisely. Um, I'll just say the one the, the one thing that one thing that irks me, like, and I, I understand I have no problem with people. I understand the folks that are maybe fed up with Franklin at this point, you know, or maybe they're mentally or they're just kind of a little checked out, just they kind of like they're kind of in a bit of a mole, just knowing like, well, yeah, we know what we're going to get. We're going to you know, lose a couple tough games and then lose one. We probably shouldn't because we're hung over from the fall previous week. Um, rinse, wash, repeat, you know, you know, brain farts, late in games kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I'll say, I only thing that irks me like just see people say, like, Oh, there's plenty of good coaches out there that we can get that can, you know, as of a, there's plenty of coaches out there that are going to be able to recruit as well as Franklin and his staff have for one. Um, and also be as if none of those coaches that you think are, are going to come in and not have their own in-game coaching issues or brain farts. Um, frankly, you look around, it's easy for like, you know, we watch Penn state mostly. So we see, we see, and we nitpick every little, thing that goes wrong it's no different with fans of other teams they see the similar issues you go on their message boards you go there's their social media folks you'll find people uh complaining about you know stuff their coaches are or aren't doing so end of the day like you know i will take franklin's in-game coaching warts if it means we can keep recruiting. They can keep recruiting at the levels they've been recruiting at. Uh, so, and the thing is, there's there's no there's no name. There's no guy out there who they would hire that I could see being an upgrade. Not just as, not just an in game coaching, but also in the recruiting department. It's got to be both. If you're Frank, if you're going to replace him, like you got to get a guy who's going to be better in both departments. And I don't see anyone out there who Penn State's realistically going to be able to hire. Now, that being said, the next question, who's your next coach going to be? Um, <laughs> eventually, my, my as long as Patrick Kraft is the athletic director, uh, 
my money is on Matt Rule. Um, from my understanding, he's he's long coveted the Penn State job. Uh, if Franklin, if 2016 turned out differently, and say Franklin, you know, moved on, uh, Matt Rule was probably going to be the next guy up at, at Penn State. And now, right now, he's uh, he's on the hot seat at, in Carolina with the Panthers, and uh, it's a good chance uh, we see him being named to a college job come December. Won't be Penn State, but it'll be some college job. But <clears throat> it'll be a thing. Uh, whenever whenever the day comes that James Franklin's no longer head coach against Penn State, you can sh- you can bet bet your whatever that. Uh, the Matt Rule and Penn State rumors are going to be flying all over, you know, the internet. So, yeah, my money's on Matt Rule for that one. Uh, last but not least, um, Mike asks us: Do you guys cover Penn State in other YouTube channels, social media? We remind you, glad you asked that, Mike. Blackshadaries.com. Uh, we, we cover Penn State sports year round. Obviously, football season on the way. We're it's just constant football coverage. So we're currently doing our daily countdown to the season, which we use by honoring current players in the roster who wear the same jersey number as how many days are left to the season opener. Or if there isn't one, we use a uh, past player to honor, honor that day. And also just a lot of preseason roundtables starting to come up. Uh, we're you know counting down the top 10 most important players in the team. Um, but yeah, it's football coverage ramping up, but also during, even when it's not football season, um, you know, Marty and I help cover basketball along with some other great writers and staff. And then <clears throat> wrestling, uh, we got a few solid wrestling writers. And I mean, that's hands down their best winter sport out there for the team. Uh, we got hockey, nice hockey coverage going. So so yeah, we you know year round we're PaxDiaries.com. Once your Penn State sports fix, that's the place to go to. So check it out there. Uh, we all, you can also follow us, um, follow the Box Diaries social media at BSD Tweets, and yeah, maybe I'll get that up on a banner here real quick for you folks. Uh, you know the one thing I will add too to build off of what Tim said. If you are a Penn State basketball fan or Penn State hockey, I, I do feel that we, we cover both Penn State basketball and Penn State hockey better than pretty much most sites out there. Um, so definitely in the winter time, if you're looking for your Penn State winter sports fix, don't be afraid to check us out, especially with basketball. I mean, Penn State wrestling, you get coverage everywhere. And not that we do a tremendous job, don't get me wrong, but with basketball and hockey, I feel like we 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 really – really hammer that a lot better than most sites do. So don't be afraid to check us out in the winter time, especially if you are people out there who are crazy enough to like what Tim and I have to say and the content we provide, because we do a majority of the basketball coverage along with Ellie Moretta Feliz, who anyone who's followed this page long enough has definitely seen on here more than a time or two. So don't be afraid to check us out in the winter time. Also. Ah, uh, yes. Someone had to make that joke. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we do. We're we're used to it. We're, we're used to it. <laughs> I mean, I'll say I feel good about. Oh, this isn't a basketball show, but I'll say I, I'm feeling good about. For the first time ever, there feels like, it feels like the the athletic department and big money donors as a whole are yes throwing money into the hoops program. There's reason to be optimistic for once about the hoops program, which, like you said, Tim, I don't know if we've ever been able to say that before. No, I mean, there's been look, there's been. Great flash in the pan moment. Well, there's been individual seasons, but there's yeah. there's reasons to be hopeful that's that sustained success. Exactly. No. Like you look at the COVID year in 2020 when COVID shut everything down. Like going into that 2019 2020 season, not to go off on a tangent here, but going into that season, there was a lot of hope that Penn State team would be very good, and they were very good. And unfortunately, got cheated out of an NCAA tournament appearance by COVID. But th- th- those seasons happen. I can think of. No, there was a year they won the NIT. There was a year, what was it, 2009, 2010, something like that, go to the tournament, losing the first round of Temple, where you were expected to be good those years. But for the first time, it feels like there's the commitment, like you said, from the athletic department with a coach of Micah Shrewsbury to make this a sustainable thing 
where you are competitive most years, not competitive one out of every five or six years. Right. That's really, that's, that's what I would like to see. That's what I've probably been waiting my whole life to see with the program. So fingers crossed, Michael Shrewsbury and crew can get that done. But anyway, uh, you know, we've done a good full 90 minutes here on the, on the show. I want to thank all of you who tuned in, whether you watch this from the start or if you just caught the last five, 10 minutes, uh, Hope you enjoyed what you saw. Oh, once again, look, you know, down there is you can catch more of our work, blackshadaris.com, follow us on Twitter, BSD tweets. Um, also, uh, as far as as far as the channel, make sure if you haven't already like and subscribe uh, on the Penn State channel, especially uh, trying to get to 500 followers before the start of the season on September 1st. Speaking of which, uh, next time Marty and I will be on, will be September 1st. Uh, we'll do a live post game reaction show. Uh, that, which, you know, knowing Fox and their pension for going to commercial all the time, that'll probably be midnight on the East Coast. Uh, so I'm already dubbing it our after dark show. Um, so, you know, but we're, they will, and then starting and then going forward uh, every week after every, you know, after every game, we'll have a live post-game reaction show. It'll usually be Marty and I, but of course, you know, we have lives. We've we also try to make it up to a, a game or two every year. So, you know, again, we'll have other, you know, great hosts from our site. You know, Ellie Moretta Felice, who you I'm sure some of you have seen. A few, he's been on a few shows with us um, and others, but. We're, 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 we're very much looking forward to doing this for a second season. Um, you know, we have, I think we both had a good time last season, despite the ups and downs. Uh, hopefully there's more ups this time around. Um, but Marty, I, how about you? But I, I can't wait. Those next two and a half weeks can't go by quickly enough. Oh, absolutely. Actually, yesterday morning, I went out. It was about 7 a.m. I went outside to let the dog out. And uh, I said it on Twitter. It's like, man, it, it felt like fall. It felt like a day I should be outside making breakfast on the Blackstone, getting really ready to come in and watch college game day. It's just here in the Northeast, at least, it, it's starting to feel like football season. The leaves are starting to change. I was coming over from my buddy's house the other night. He lives about 20 minutes away from me. And there's a stretch of highway between his house and mine just lined with trees. And the leaves are starting to change. And you're feeling it in the mornings. You're feeling it in the evenings. He said, here in the Northeast, it feels like football season. And it just – it gets me even more excited than I already would be for, for football to roll around. Absolutely. Uh, someone asked you to put a link to the channel in the comments. So I just put it in there. There's, there's the link to our YouTube channel. So uh, hope you all enjoy the show, everyone. And uh, we will catch you on September 1st. <laughs>